I want to own businesses that get to set their price. Price makers versus price takers may be the most unknown billionaire in the world. He has been completely away from the limelight, busy building one of the most impressive public companies, definitely in Canadian markets, but in the world as well. Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Hotsko, and on today's episode, I am joined by Brayden Dennis. Brayden, welcome to the show. Rebecca, thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming back on. For our listeners who didn't catch your previous episode with Robert, you're an engineer by training before becoming a full-time entrepreneur. You have achieved a lot in terms of business, investing. I listened to your podcast, The Canadian Investor, and I want to talk a bit about your investing strategy and style. I know that if I could go back to when I first started investing, there's a lot that I would do differently and a lot of mistakes I could have avoided. I'm wondering, what do you think are some of the most important factors or steps you've taken that have really driven your success today as an investor that you maybe wish you knew from day one? Well, there are two very, very common mistakes I see every DIY investor make in the start of their journey. Number one is buying subpar crummy businesses for really cheap valuation multiples. I think overall long-term investors will be better served buying higher quality businesses. So I think that that is one that I see a lot and a mistake I committed. And two, falling for yield traps. They see that high dividend yield on the stock platform that they're using. And you know they just see, well, I can get paid X percent. I could potentially even live off this. And and while dividend income and income strategies are totally legit for most people, you know, searching for 10 plus percent dividend yields, you're probably talking about a business in structural decline and looking at permanent capital loss in your portfolio. Typically, I see this all the time in questions that come to our podcast. Like, hey, can you review this 15% yielder, like, you know, couple tens of million in market cap company. And I, I'm just like, oh man, no, like one, no, no, we're not going to look at it. And two, you're, you're looking at potentially huge yield traps. So uh, value traps and income yield traps constantly I see. And most DIY investors, including me, made these these two exact mistakes. I see it all the time. Yeah, on the dividend yield, I remember making that one too. And I don't like when filters have a dividend yield because it is so misleading. It can be just because the share price plummeted. And for example, I know a lot of emerging markets, I think the Brazilian ETF actually has like a double digit dividend yield. And it doesn't mean it's a bad investment, but it also doesn't mean it's a good one. And if the history of the dividend yield, you have to look back on that and see if it's actually sustainable. Can they pay it out based on their dividend payout ratio? And so there's some things that investors need to do besides just looking at that number at face value. Yeah, I think that that's totally right. Now you're, you're talking about payout ratios and you know the history and, and all of all of that data is not hard to find. It's 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 easy to find these days. It's just the fact that uh, it's so alluring to think of it as a new you know income stream. Everyone wants to wake up and you know while they were sleeping they were just printing money. Often it's it's not as simple as that, uh, not only in business and in entrepreneurship, but also with your investing portfolio. Um, income is rarely that passive. And so I think that there are a lot of merit to wonderful dividend paying stocks. I own many of them. Some of them are some of the highest quality businesses in the world. Think of Visa and MasterCard who consistently hike their dividend at aggressive paces. Um, you know, think of Apple. They these are dividend paying stocks, and some of the biggest blue chips in the world that also have growth prospects for the future. But that's that's the important part is that they're really solid businesses with strong fundamentals and and pretty great prospects for the future. From when we're recording here today, uh, not to be mistaken with just some I'll get paid on on a dividend yield. So I would say that that's a very common mistake kind of circling back to your first question. 
So then what does your investment framework or your process for finding stocks look like? Because everyone has their own methods to find them, but how do you get stocks on your radar? Yeah, good question. I mean, there are so many ways you can do it. Some people are very quantitative and are looking at stock screeners, which I think is, is helpful for people to start getting a, a list of investable ideas. But that must be the st- start of a process and not the finish of a process where you have to actually look into the business characteristics. Do they have a recognizable moat? Do they have you know a profitable business that, that can endure for a really long time? Can it grow for a long time? And so these are the six types of questions that I ask myself once I've maybe found a good idea, whether it's you know online or through a stock screener or just in my own life. Like just paying attention to the things you see, uh, you know, things that you can contextualize uh, and experience all the time. You know, it's it's the old Peter Lynch thing. You go to the mall and you do channel checks on which businesses are killing it. Um, You could have gone to the mall and noticed that Lululemon has been crushing it for well over a decade now. And investors have made boatloads of money uh, being a shareholder. So idea generation is an art. There's no one right way or wrong way to do it. But if I do have an idea that I'm very interested in, you have to be very selective. Because if you don't have a extremely high barrier for greatness, you will end up with 40, 50 meh stocks in your portfolio. You won't know what's going on with them. You won't know which metrics to track and you won't know what makes them great. And so if you are giving yourself an extremely high barrier for greatness, then either you're going to have probably great businesses in your portfolio or the overall, you know, sum of your portfolio is going to get better over time. There's just no... There's no one telling you you have to own anything less than greatness. And that's what makes being you know, a DIY investor so great. So those six things are just growing top line consistently and, and, and profits on, on free cash flow. I mean, there are tons of ways to buy a stock that's maybe reducing the share count quite aggressively, returning cash back to shareholders via a dividend. Um, you know, there, there's lots of ways for investors to get compensated. But I have rarely seen investors do extremely well on businesses that have a shrinking business and structural decline unless they're looking to be in and out of it trading, which, which I'm not looking to do. Uh, Number two, a recognizable moat that's durable. Now, there are many books you can read on this. There are so many ways to think about durability in a business, whether it has high switching costs. It's just such a pain to to switch off. A a good example is a cloud provider, okay? Someone I really like, I was listening to a podcast, and they were describing switching from your cloud provider, like trying to change the airplane engine mid-flight. And I wholeheartedly agree as running a, as running a software company today, these are really, really high switching costs. So that's very recognizable. Um, I do like businesses that are underpinned by secular growth trends. An obvious one here, like think like cybersecurity, Microsoft and CrowdStrike, the two leaders there. Now, number four, should probably go to number one in my list, which is a business that has pricing power. You know, if you come listen to my podcast, you'll have, you know, just one penny for every time I talk about pricing power and you'll be very well off. And the reason for that is I want to own businesses that get to set their price, not price take. So this is price makers versus price takers. A price taker is an example of a commodity business. Uh, you know, if you sell a commodity, you sell oil and gas, your prices are dictated by the market versus iPhones are decided by the Apple boardroom. Uh, the price of, you know, the newest MacBook is decided in a, in a meeting in the afternoon. So that's an, exa- an example of a price maker. And then last two, just to, to quickly round this out, they demonstrate consistently high returns on invested capital and that the management is aligned with long-term performance and execution. Uh, I think that those go a long way, require a little bit more nuance in your research, but um, 
the long-term winners are run by winners, typically, historically. So uh, those are the six things I'm always looking for. That was super helpful. And I think that was a really good encompassing checklist that we can use when we are looking at businesses, if they meet all of those. And one that you talked about was a moat. And a lot of investors are familiar with this concept who've studied Warren Buffett, looking for that sustainable competitive advantage, but that is easier said than done. And so I'm wondering if you can speak about what are some of the most important factors you look for to identify that a company has a moat and not a fake moat? No, I think that it's a great question because anecdotally you can be tricked into thinking it has some wonderful moat, maybe because of your bias. Uh, maybe it's the, you know, the, the company you're familiar with and you're not, you're not as familiar with the competitive advantage that, uh, sorry, the competitive landscape that it's out there. And so I think that that's a great question. Historically, you haven't had to be first to many of the mega winners. You know, how long could you have recognized Apple was onto something great, Netflix was onto something great, Amazon was onto something great? You know, dollar for dollar, you know, in terms of the total investment that Warren Buffett threw down in Apple was well, well after, I'm going to boldly say you and I both had iPhones in our pockets, um, well after that Berkshire Hathaway uh, initiated a gigantic position in Apple. And it may go down as the best investment maybe of all time in his portfolio, just based on how much capital they've, they've thrown down. It is now worth over 40% of the Berkshire Hathaway uh, public portfolio. And so you haven't had to notice the moat right away. Sure, if you want like 100 baggers in your portfolio and you're looking for micro caps, sure, maybe. But you haven't had to. And so that competitive advantage, that durable moat, sometimes has been obvious for decades. Uh, I was talking about Visa and MasterCard for a while. Those are not new businesses. They have extreme, extreme competitive network effects. If I want to start up some card network, it's not going to work. Why? Because the merchant doesn't accept it and, and no one has it in their, in their wallet. And so you just have this cold start problem with network effects. Again, these are businesses that are, you could have made extreme, uh, extremely amazing compounded annual returns and been very like, quote unquote, late to the party. So I think recognizing the moat does not have to be some sort of early stage. Usually it is what is called, what I like to call obviously great. It's just obviously amazing. Uh, you can explain, I can explain it to my, you know, two-year-old niece about why it's amazing. And um, in very simple words, I, th I think that simplicity is often the easiest way to describe great moats. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I struggle with when it's a very well-known company like Apple or something is when it gets so popular and the price runs up just by popularity, then you can lose if you overpay for that growth and your returns will suffer. Even if you were right about the investment, if you're paying too high, then it doesn't matter. And then I guess the other thing is you also mentioned return on invested capital is super important. Well, I guess the other thing is if you're wrong about the growth and it reverts to the mean, then you suffer too. So it's, it's a tricky game. Do you have any tips on how to find if a company has a sustainable growth rate? Again, great question. And it ties back to if they remain to have their competitive advantage. There's a book that I just finished called Seven Powers. And it talks about the seven competitive advantages that businesses can use. And of course, there may be more than seven. But these seven speak to how a company can retain its high return on invested capital and its long-term growth trajectory because it's able to push off competitors. Every good moat should have a long list of dead bodies of the companies that tried to compete with it. Um, you know, and, and so that doesn't mean that it's gonna stay there forever. Let's look at the largest 20 companies by market cap in 1989. Not one of them 
is in the top 20 by market cap today in 2022. Not even one of them. And those were the 20 most powerful, widest moat, fastest growing, just behemoths, companies that had gravitational pulls in 1989. Not one of them is on the top 20 by market cap today. And so it doesn't mean that many of them have disappeared. It just means that you know, it's it's a new era and many of the companies today are defined by big technology and those kinds of things. So let's look at an example like Google, a company I hold today, I think is one of the best businesses of all time. If you have been paying attention to what's happening in AI, you can get actually better results from using AI completely open source for free than the search engine results pages of Google today. And so this is something that I will I refuse to get caught in my own bias of saying it's the best business of all time and then watching uh you know a completely disruptive technology dis- destroy how they make money on the search engine results page. And so that's something that I have to be aware of uh as an investor and continually monitor the thesis and continue to track just one, two metrics that are important. Um, For instance, let's use Spotify, a company, again, that many of us know. The two most important metrics are, in my opinion, how many premium subscribers are adding each month. That's one metric. And two, it's gross margins because their margin, it's very difficult for them to reach real operating leverage with their business model. I tracked gross margin for eight quarters in a row It didn't improve like my investment thesis I thought was gonna have. I love the company. I had to throw out my bias and I I exited the position. I gave myself two full years, eight full quarters of them saying, the gross margins are gonna improve next quarter, promise. And so if if that's just not happening, I I use the app like eight hours a day. I'm obsessed with it, I love it. Um, But I had to throw those biases aside because I was just tracking one, two, three metrics that I think are the most important for the business or else it's really easy to get lost in the weeds and really track their competitive advantage over time. That's great that you mentioned that because I think some people can be biased if they really love it. They almost want to make the investment work no matter what, even if you use the product all the time. But if your valuation doesn't match up with the price, then it's time to sell. And so I am wondering now that we heard your checklist on what you look for to find these high quality businesses, do you have a specific company or investment that you want to talk about that meets all your criteria so we can see this framework in action? Sure thing. I think that's a useful exercise Uh, just for the sake of the show. And, you know, me being here in Canada, it's always good to highlight one of my largest single equity position constellation software is ticker csu on the toronto stock exchange it's about 40 ish 45 billion in market cap in canadian dollars so that's like well like a couple bucks in usd right like just that's like three dollars and 20 cents in usd um constellation software is a roll-up of niche vertical market software companies headed up by mark leonard who may be the most unknown billionaire in the world if you you know in today's age if you're a billionaire and you you search their name on google you could probably find extensive information about them interviews at least a couple photos there are two photos there was three and it seems to have disappeared from the internet uh two photos active on google of mark leonard he has been completely away from the limelight and busy building one of the most impressive public companies in definitely in Canadian markets, but in the world as well. So today, if you if, if you get an idea of the context of returns that Mark Leonard has, has, has gotten, we're talking about more than a 30% compound annual growth rate for 20-ish years, which is astounding um, and, and really hard to wrap your head around because they have acquired 122 niche vertical market software businesses in the last trailing 12 months, which is like an unbelievable pace. Uh, That's deploying the equivalent of 1.7 billion in capital in their last 12 months. To give you context of how they have scaled this up, 
they only deployed 173 million of capital just in 2016. So the bear case on consolation has always been you're buying these tiny mission critical niche vertical market software companies in rural America, Europe, Asia, Canada, like very random, obscure businesses. How are they going to keep doing this and do it at an accelerated pace to justify the market cap? And they have not only done it by a growing amount every year, but at an accelerated pace every year. And so this goes back to my my thought about winners win, not only winning businesses keep winning, but winning operators and winning founders and winning entrepreneurs keep winning. And Mark Leonard is especially that. Um, you know, I, I adore him and I know almost nothing about him other than hearing him on a few uh, few calls with the, with shareholders other and that he's 6'5 and looks like Gandalf the Grey. Uh, literally, like he has the beard down to ear. And so just these real outsiders, these these people that are just cut from a different cloth tend to run extremely good public companies. And often many of them are still run by their founder like Mark Leonard. So I think that he's worth uh, worth calling out um, and, and seeing what they can do over the next 10 plus years, continuing to roll up a category that I'm very bullish on which is small mission critical vertical market software businesses. To give you an example, say I have payroll software that is specifically for running a gymnastics club. Like it does just the features that you, Rebecca, as a gymnastics club owner would be like, that's for me. I need it. It's better than, you know, using a big thing like QuickBooks or ADP or something like that. That's the type of businesses we're talking about. Some of them they're buying have do like only a couple hundred grand in revenue. So we're talking about small, small companies buying them usually directly from the founders or from the family. And there are over 40,000 of them in their database that they're ready to roll up. So they haven't even scratched the surface. There is increased competition because many people have realized Mark Leonard can't be the only one, you know, buying these things. These are too juicy. Uh, at usually really good multiples as well. So they do have increased competition, but they've built out this wonderful decentralized model to be able to buy that many companies. We're talking about over 100 per year. Wow. I haven't actually done, I'm in Canada too, but I haven't done too much research on that one. So I definitely am after this interview. I am wondering, does it lack anywhere on your checklist? Is there anything that you're kind of unsure about? You kind of mentioned the competition could be rising up, I guess. What would make you change your views on the company? For sure. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic is the businesses that they typically buy do not have many of the characteristics I'm talking about. I'm talking about not great products because they're buying them at such low multiples. They usually have really, really high switching costs, which is good, but we're not talking about like the best in class products. They actually usually have like zero or even negative organic growth on the whole ecosystem of Constellation Software's businesses they own. Um, you know, I've, the last five plus years, just they're, they're doing like 5% organic growth. So we're not talking about great businesses. They're not buying wonderful businesses. They're buying steady cash flows of niche uh, mission critical businesses that just can keep humming along. What their key differentiator and their competitive advantage is that they have built out a group of six operating groups that perform this m a in every corner of the earth and we're talking about for instance topicus which is actually a, a, they spun part of it off but we don't need to get into that they're a dutch company that rolls up various languages of these software so say i have that exact same payroll software but i'm a german business and none of my competitors the big intuits of the world are not building this product for for Germany or for the Netherlands or for Belgium. There, there's just no real competition in that ocean. So they're able to scale in a way that is very hard to replicate. 
And so that that the, the mothership has competitive advantages, but the businesses they have don't. So this is actually a very weird one to put through my checklist. Um, luckily, you know, I don't sell winners. And now you can see why it's such a large position in my portfolio. If you take a look at how Constellation Software stock has performed. So just thinking of the intrinsic value assessment of this, do you have to do anything differently to value this company than other maybe more traditional business models? I wouldn't say so. I mean, over time, what drives returns for, for stocks? And the best metric, in my opinion, is free cash flow per share. Um, at the end of the day, you get all this noise and free cash flow is, is not a steady metric like you like EBIT or even EPS, but over time, free cash flow per share is what ultimately drives shareholder returns in the long run. And so it's very obvious to see that this business is consistently producing more free cash flow year after year and at, at an accelerated pace. And as for per share, they went public with 21 million shares and there are 21 million left today. There's, there's, there's been no dilution or buybacks. They have a very, very unique corporate structure where the management team has to actually take their bonus and buy shares on the public market. That's how their bonus is compensated and that's how they drive incentive structures without giving out stock-based compensation. Um, and so... Over time, I mean, valuing any company is is more art than science, I, I have found, which my engineering brain hates, by the way, um, because I'm definitely a math, more math focused than, art, than creativity and art focused. But at the end of the day, a company like this, yeah, you're probably play, paying a premium. You have been paying a premium to own it for a really long time, but... If you have a insight onto why you should own it for 10 plus years, if you pay a 20% premium over its intrinsic value today and they continue even remotely close, even half of how they've compounded free cash flow per share over time, you will do extremely well. Um, and so that's the, way I, that's the way I look at it. I'm just trying to own businesses and not grossly overpay. And I think that many investors were grossly overpaying for growth in 2021. Something had to give. Um, I got absolutely wrecked on Shopify from my entry point because I thought there's no way I'm buying this thing at 50 times sales. It went to 20 times sales and I'm like, okay, I'll nibble on it for this, like, this secular winner in this space. And you know the multiples halved again since then. So... I broke my cardinal rule of, of don't overpay and I, and I, I, I wore it. Thank God it was like a 1% position, but this is why, you know, I can come up here and say, you know, stick to a, a rules based investment strategy to avoid mistakes, but no one is without mistakes. I, I've made a handful of them in just in the past couple of years. I do want to touch on the overpaying thing. Do you have any, cause I think that's hard for some investors to know how if they're overpaying so do you have any tips that you like to use is there a certain threshold of metrics that you won't overpay if it hits a certain ratio or what do you kind of look at in terms of that yeah it, it well it depends on the growth rate and the quality of the business but let's just throw those aside because there's too much nuance for that for this conversation i do think that you know if you're buying something at multiples we're talking about over 20x sales. We're talking about well, well above the norm of multiples. And this will happen quite often when there's a narrative driving these businesses. Like I'll give the narrative that was in 2021. These software companies are just different. You know, software as a service is the best business model ever invented. Look at the margins. Look at this. Look at that. And then you see some of them get absolutely crushed, like 80% off those highs from that narrative being set in. And 
they still have to live within the laws of, of business and basic unit economics. They were not going towards profitability whatsoever. They were sold the drug of venture capital since inception that they don't have to actually find any operating leverage or any operating profits ever. Uh, number three, the ownership structure is ridiculous because you're st- you're doubling the share count every five years through stock-based compensation. And so those go against how you, remember I just said, how do you make money with a stock? You compound free cash flow per share. Are any of those, none of those things I mentioned are, are going towards that goal. You had a heavy dilution and zero profits. Yeah, you had a lot of top line growth, but it wasn't affecting the underlying unit economics whatsoever. Um, and so there has to be some limit to what you're willing to pay. I mean, what's the the, the market median PE today? Like, like 22-ish? Yeah. So if you're going well, well above that, then it, the business must either be incredibly good, which is a legit reason to pay a premium. And by good, I mean just like durable, demands respect, demands rep- power in the marketplace. Or two, be growing extremely, extremely fast. Like you look at like a crowd strike, like a cybersecurity business growing like, like 75% year over year on the top line sustained for a long time that needs to trade at a much higher premium than the market multiple, given the network effects they're building and the growth that they're accomplishing. So again, I know I'm giving you a cop-out answer here again, but it, it is an art. But typically you will know, gut check, am I overpaying for this thing? Like is 30 times sales a ridiculous multiple? Like how do I ever make money on that? You're, you're in Canada as well here. Remember the 2018 market craze of cannabis stocks? Like you were an idiot if you didn't own cannabis stocks. All my buddies are like, man, you're on a finance podcast and you're not in on these? Like, are you out of your mind? Look, I've tripled my money this week. And in the short term, you're like, okay, I'm yeah, sure, whatever. Like you just got to pretend you look like an idiot for a couple of weeks or a couple, sometimes a couple of years actually. And Aurora Cannabis, which by the way is a, a zero and probably in bankruptcy filings very shortly, traded at 218 times their forward next year sales. How do you make money doing that? Like, th- there's that's a clear overpay. Uh, and so multiples can help guide you. When I say multiples, I mean, you know, PE, price to cash flow, EV to EBITDA, price to sales. Um, and there's, there's right ways to use each one depending on the, the level of the business and where it's at and its maturation cycle. But there are obvious ways to know you're overpaying. Yeah, you said so many great things there because a higher multiple can be justified if it's justified by a higher growth rate and stuff like that. It can warrant a higher multiple. That is exactly what that means. But in a lot of the cases, it doesn't. And so I think when I think about that, two checks come to mind. You can look at the absolute, you can look at the stock relative to its own history. So you can look at various multiples because price to earnings can be highly manipulated. Sometimes that one doesn't make a lot of sense depending on the business cycle. So looking at the most relevant one for that company in that industry, sometimes it's price to sales or price to book, whatever, use a combination, but then also looking at the multiples relative to its industry and then kind of comparing where it lies next to its competitors, that should give you at least some relative comparison where it should be trading at relative to its peers. That's right. I mean, and there is a lot of ways to get in trouble using valuation metrics because, you know, you can fall into some value traps that we were discussing before. Maybe the business isn't great uh, and you're going the other way of the spectrum. You're saying, okay, all right, I'm not buying, you know, 50, 50 PE companies. I'm buying eight PE companies and you're buying businesses that are potentially in heavily structural decline over time. Uh, their the competitive landscape has changed in a major way. Uh, the top line's not growing, even probably shrinking. And so, while that might be a pawn to find some great deals, it's also going to be a pond of businesses that are a lot worse 
in five years than they are today. And at the end of the day, I mean, it, it's so easy to complicate investing, right? It's so easy to complicate it. And, and the investment world has thrived on the fact that it's complicated. That, that's, that's their business is that it's complicated. You know, let me, let me collect management fees on that. And this is not a knock on management fees. People are, you know, doing their, their job and providing a lot of value for their clients. That's cool. But at the end of the day, it's buying businesses, both whether you're a professional or a retail investor, buying businesses that in the future are going to be better, stronger, more profitable, have a greater gravitational pull, more competitive, more durable, all of the good things that you'd want if it was your own business. Those are the things that you'd, you'd hope are in five years. And if you're hunting in low multiple spaces, you just won't check off many of those things. You'll have businesses that are in terminal decline and are probably going to be worse businesses to own in the next 10 years than they are now. And the shift that Warren Buffett made when he was, it sounds ridiculous because he was like 22 when he made the shift from when he was 13, like the, the, the Oracle always making us feel bad was when he shifted to thinking like a business owner and not a business trader is when his entire, uh, you know, world flipped upside down. I will say that is the one thing that I love about the Warren Buffett strategy and I follow is think like a business owner, because even when I started my first business, it finally made sense why you should invest that way, because you think you can simplify it. What matters to a business? How much are they making? How much revenue are you bringing in? And then from that, how much are you taking home after you pay all your expenses, your taxes? It just makes everything so simple. And we overcomplicate a lot in investing. And it's just really not necessary a lot of the time. I think that some of my best investments have honestly been like back of the envelope math where it's like, does this business make sense to me? It does. And it it works out because you don't need sometimes all these complicated discounted cash flow models because the more assumptions, the more room for error too. So it's just something that I think about, but I do want to get your thoughts on Shopify because you mentioned that um, I just looked at the PE today and it is still 300. I did have a listener ask about this stock. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Yeah. So I think a more useful place to start the conversation on Shopify and its valuation is that using the PE malt ratio for an, a company like Shopify, which is growing heavily, building out important infrastructure, spending tons of money to do that, building out new lines of business and new optionality like payments and actual infrastructure so that they can compete with Amazon on delivery times and stuff like that. Those are not cheap things to do. Uh, like like Amazon, you know, it's a tech company, but it's extremely cap intensive. It's extremely capital intensive. They have over 600 million square feet of warehousing to make the magic button you click online to the package showing up the next day. Very capital intensive. And so if you're talking about PE, uh, high you know, high cost to running the business, you're not going to have a lot of look through earnings. But if you look at the business today on what they're generating on a gross profit line item today, the growth is explosive. And it is the category leader. And if you want to start building e commerce today, um, I'll just go on stratosphere.io, which is, you know, the, the platform that I use that I started to track these KPIs for, you know, what makes the business tick. And over time, subscription solutions revenue in the last 10 years has gone from 19.2 million to 1.4 billion. Merchant solutions revenue have gone from 4.5 million to 3.8 billion. Gross payments volume have gone from zero to almost 100 billion in, in gross payments volume. So we're talking about significant scale, and we're talking about a business that has now developed important competitive advantages around its ecosystem that it operates, the partnerships that they've built, and all of the add-ons and applications that have been built in their like equivalent of the app store uh, for Shopify partners. And so I always love technology businesses that start to have innovation happen on top of it. Not 
inside of the business, but on top of the business. The payment networks are a perfect example of this. You have all these fintech operators happening on top of the payment rails. And then Autodesk is a great example for those who are familiar with AutoCAD and Revit, which is architecture, uh, engineering, construction, software. There's all this cool innovation happening on top of the Autodesk ecosystem. And so that becomes a competitive advantage that you're the API and the infrastructure for all this innovation happening on top of it. And Shopify is an example of a company that's benefited from that. Now, it's not a comp, uh, you know, when without any competition, there's lots of e-commerce builders that are out there today, but there is a bit of a network effect and brand really matters here. Brand is a competitive advantage one that I don't lean too heavy on, you know, hang my hat on because brand can change over time. But if you want to start building a store to sell on e-commerce today, you're going to Shopify. It's the name that you know, it's the name you trust, you know that they're going to have the best infrastructure and build your site the best. And this is a growing field and it's very sticky. You're not going to switch your store infrastructure maybe to save 20 bucks each month it just makes no sense to do that. And so there's a they have a lot going for them. Now, if you look at the stock, it's gotten absolutely decimated from its peak. I mean, what did it trade at? Uh, I'm looking at the USD listing here, 170 to four, all the way down to 30 bucks, 27 bucks, and now trade up at 43. So it's, it's had a quite a nice little bounce off the bottom. But again, we're talking about a, a stock that traded at valuation multiples that had no room for error. And what happens when you have no room for error in a valuation multiple is if they have any little bit of guidance pulled, any mentions on the conference call of slower growth, any mentions of, hmm, maybe COVID did accelerate our pace faster than uh, faster than expected and you know it's gonna be more, maybe more 2019 levels moving forward, that is a recipe for a huge, stock decline. And so this is where valuation really matters, especially in the short term. Now we might look 10 years from now and go, wow, um, it was still even cheap at, at its peak there. But if that happens, we're talking about exceptional, exceptional execution. And that's what stocks trading at high valuation multiples like that. The risk is, is that if there is any little room for mistakes in the business execution, management changing, growth slowing, new competitors. There's just not much room for error in the story for investors to make money. And so that that's that's my opinion on Shopify here today. I think looking forward, the business looks exceptional. Uh, it's a category winner in an important growing industry. Every KPI I can possibly find looks amazing. The the management team is is smart. They know what they're doing. They've still run by the founders, which is another thing I love. And they have a lot of optionality moving forward. So there's more. There's a longer list of things I like than I don't like. Mm -hmm. Have you done an intrinsic value on it, or would you have any views on if it's undervalued at the current price? Because yeah, I was looking at the price and how much it's gone down from over 170 to now 40. It is looking pretty attractive, but do you have any particular thoughts on it? Yeah. So one thing I'll, I'll, I'll say is proper valuation doesn't care about how high off of a stock price high it is. The stock could be not, not let's throw it Shopify for a second. Let's think, think of an, an example of a stock that is was trading at 100 and is now $20 might be more overvalued than when it was at 100 um just based on have things materially changed about the business random idea i don't know why this is coming to my head but let's think of coca-cola for instance if coca-cola it was trading at x dollars and it gets cut in half by 80% because the US government says we're no longer allowed to sell sugary drinks in a can and the stock goes to 10 bucks. It might be more expensive at 10 bucks based on its future prospects than, you know, a thousand bucks. And so it's really important to think about valuation from where we are today and what the business can produce in the future, not off of its high. That being said, 
it can open your eyes to a disconnect in the market between something very unloved and its actual business fundamentals. Shopify's business fundamentals continue to get better and continue to be great. They never were not great, despite the stock moving up and down. Remember how we were talking about we like to complicate things? This is because every single second of the business hours, I can watch Shopify stock go up and down. And, and that may, to me, incorrectly be a signal of its value when it may be completely disconnected to the stock's actual value. And more importantly, the business's long-term value. Uh, have I done a DCF on Shopify recently? No. Do I do DCFs often? Almost hardly never, even though I built a tool <laughs> for people to save levered and unlevered DCFs right in, uh, right in our application. What I like to do is I have a journal of expectations I have for the business. So for Shopify, for instance, I have expectations for monthly recurring revenue over time, for the payments business to increase, total subscription solution customers, and how their ecosystem's changing. Those are what four or five metrics. I have them tracked exactly here. I'm looking them on them on my screen, and they all look exceptional, and they all look tracking exactly how I expected. Back to the Spotify example, not to be confused with Shopify. I was tracking premium subscribers and gross margin. Premium subscribers, A-OK, -okay, check mark. Gross margin, no. Now, if that changes, then I'm willing to change my opinion. An investor's superpower is to be able to change their mind. It is the number one most important superpower for every investor. This is a game of managing your emotions more than anything. And so there are a lot of reasons that the narrative becomes driven by the stock price when in reality it should be driven by the business fundamentals. And if the business fundamentals are tracking exactly how you suspected they would, then maybe there's no reason to, uh, to look at it. I think most investors do better if they don't look at their brokerage account, maybe ever. I definitely agree with you. And I'm so happy you mentioned that bias. I can't remember what that bias is called actually, but when there's a certain price that either you bought at, you kind price of always anchoring. have that price. Yes. Price anchoring. You have it in your head then. And I think the more we're aware of these biases, the better investors we can be because then we don't fall victim to them. The last company I want to get your thoughts on before I let you go though is brookfield asset management another canadian company we're doing the whole this canadian one, gambit here today <laughs> we are i think canada has so many interesting equities right now so i'm really happy we got to talk about a bunch this is a really interesting company right now because they're doing a spin-off and i was hoping you could talk a little bit about it what your thoughts are on it and if it might be a good buy for some investors great question and back to your thing about canada is i think that there's an important thing to point out here right is these are canadian businesses canadian listed mostly dual listed except for constellation software but their business hardly resides in canada we're talking about global superpowers in their category and brookfield asset management is certainly in that category you know running a canadian investing podcast like 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 i do we get questions all the time on why we don't like certain Canadian domestic names. And our, our answer is it's underweight scale. How can it scale outside of the borders? And if, if it can't reach potentially 8 billion customers on, on planet Earth, then it might not be a good business. And that's why technology has been such a good performer is that you're able to tap into to that kind of scale. Now, as for Brookfield Asset Management, we're talking about a global superpower in alternative assets. What does that mean? Alternative assets. We're talking about real infrastructure, renewable power, utilities, energy, real estate. And all on top of that is this very complicated management structure, a bit of a black box run by a guy named Bruce Flat out of Canada here. And he runs Brookfield Asset Management. They've compounded the stock under his tenure for over 20 years by 17% on the campaign on your growth rate. If you look at all the spinoffs, and I'm gonna to touch on that spinoff you just asked me about in a second, to give you some context of the scale of the business today, 762 billion of assets under management, 407 billion of that is actually collecting fees from the asset management business. So, you know, we talked about great businesses like software, 
Asset management has a lot of those same recurring high margin characteristics as well. And they have 407 billion of it collecting fees uh, for the business right now. They have a very unique operating structure because not only are they spinning up funds to collect management fees on it, but they're also operating those assets. And so they are a gigantic operator of assets like renewable hydroelectric power stations. They're one of the largest single owner of renewable hydro power stations. Uh, think of dams uh, around the world. And um, you have that really unique structure of not only running the asset management business, but also operating it gives them unique scale and unique expertise. Now, in just a few days away, Brookfield Asset Management will be doing a spin-off of their asset management business. Because like I mentioned, we're talking about renewable power, infrastructure projects, real estate. Those subsidiaries are all also publicly traded as pure play. So say you want to own just renewable power, you can own uh, BEP, which is the renewable power business, which is publicly listed. Uh, I think in the US, it's called BEPC, which is the US listing. Now, what they're going to do is spin off the asset management business that has that set 407 billion of fee bearing capital as its own entity. Now, why would they do that? The reason is, is if you look out at competitors like Blackstone, who are also managing alternatives, they think that those companies are be, being rewarded higher multiples. And so they think in the short term, they can unlock value by having a pure play on the asset management business. The total corporation will be called Brookfield Corporation. It's going to be listed as ticker BN, which does not exist yet, but in a few days it will. And it's going to own 75% of that asset management business. So we're talking about roughly owning 75% of all of the individual operating groups um, that they have. And so I my the way I've always played it is to just own the mothership, which has been Brookfield Asset Management. The mothership will turn into Brookfield Corporation, ticker BN, and I'll probably just roll it all into that because one, I like simplicity and I like uh, the prospects of almost every single segment of the business. And it is run by Bruce Flat, who gets almost no credit. Um, you know, in small investing circles, he'll be you'll get lots of credit. So if you're in those circles and you've been a Bruce Flat fan, you're like, what do you mean? But globally, Brookfield Asset Management is a behemoth and has, you know, if you ask someone on the street if they know what Brookfield Asset Management is, they'll probably say no, unless they're in Toronto. Yeah, I was diving into this company today because you put it on my radar for this conversation. And it is really interesting because the reason that businesses would do a spinoff is because they believe the sum of the parts is worth more than the whole. And so I did read an article. I don't know if this came directly from them, but it said the company believes its business is worth 82 to $94 per share where it's trading, I think around $45 per share right now. And so we won't know if that's realized until after, but what's interesting about the split off with the asset management company compared to the corporation will be, it'll have a higher dividend yield because it will they plan to pay out 90% of its annual earnings to shareholders. And so I think there's just a lot of interesting things about this company right now in terms of payout. And I mean, we'll see in the future if it actually unlocks the value it says, but I do think it's worth checking out. It certainly is worth checking out. And I mean, on a 20 year basis, Brookfield Asset Management, it's on just the stock price, you're talking about 16% compound annual growth rate. And that doesn't include all the spins that it's done of unlocking value over time. So you've got even better return if you've just held uh, all the spinoffs that they've done that have come into your brokerage account, including the one that we're talking about that's going to happen in a few days. It, we're talking about a company that just does the right thing consistently over time to increase the value of the business, but also maximize shareholder returns through doing like, why would they do all of it, all of this? Right. And it's because in the short term and potentially in the long term, it can unlock a lot of value. You have a very complicated black box of all these different types of real assets and the asset management business 
all grouped into one. The real estate business used to actually trade under its own ticker as well. Commercial and you know big malls got so cheap in 2020 that they said, okay, we're buying the entire thing off the public markets. These these this, these assets are world class. We're talking about you know some of the best office buildings in major city centers like New York, London, Toronto, and like anchor type malls, like the biggest mall in one of those major cities. We're not talking about you know sub tier cities, small strip malls. We're talking about like best of the best type of real estate. And so they said, okay, if the market thinks this, we're just going to eat the entire thing and steal steal it off the public market for pennies on the dollar. These are the kinds of things that they have historically done for decades now. And there's just really no reason to doubt their acumen now, especially because of how incentivized the management team is. The management team owns an unbelievable amount of stock, including Bruce Flatt, who's the CEO and who's run the business for a long time now. They own a ton of stock. Um, and so that's that's always nice seeing those those incentives aligned. And winners like Bruce Flat keep winning. And so doubting that he can continue to do that seems like a losing proposition. Uh, and, and Brookfield Asset Management and, and the mothership, which will become BN, is a business that uh, I string, I think very, very highly of. That was a really good point you made because for such a massive company to have that um, much ownership in it, they are really behind it and you have to believe in their vision. I do have one last question on this. Um, if someone were to buy, do you have any views on if a new investor was going to or want exposure to this, would you prefer one over the other once it does the star or the spin off, or would you suggest maybe holding both? You know, it's funny. It's a, it's a great question and one that I keep thinking about and I don't have a clear answer yet. And I think that that's totally okay. And the, the, the spinoff hasn't happened. What I'm going to do is what I usually do 90% of the time or more than that with investment decisions is do absolutely nothing until I have strong conviction into one way or another. I do want to see a couple quarters of the asset management business spun out because like I said, it's been this black box that the market might go, oh my God, like, uh, you know, we need to put the right multiples like Blackstone on that have been, and, and maybe it's even better business than that. So the answer is I'm doing absolutely nothing for probably two to four quarters. If I have some sort of strong conviction one way or another uh, to own both or to just roll it all into the, the main corporation, um, that's, that's a likely outcome as well. So we'll see. I think that many investors, when they have a decision staring them in the face, should I buy the security? Should I sell the security? Because selling is way harder than buying. It's a way harder decision. Um, there's way more emotion and, and price anchoring being attached to that. So what's the right thing to do? Usually nothing. Uh, and just think about it. You don't have to act on this. It doesn't have to be decided in a quarter or a year, even, even a decade. Like We're talking about great businesses. We're not talking about penny stocks or, you know, some, something that they need to get some drug approval by the FDA for it to, for it to work. So that allows me to have a longer leash and have the ability to make the right decision and think because most investing is done by thinking and acting very little. You know, if, if, if this isn't the, the piece of the pie, I want to do almost no doing. I want to do a lot of thinking and very little doing. A great way to end the show. Before I let you go, where can the audience go to connect with you and learn more about your work, your podcast, and everything that you put out? Sure. Thanks. So I do run a podcast called The Canadian Investor. It's twice a week. We do talk about you know these kinds of stuff, long-term investing, some Canadian stocks, but lots of global stocks as well. And then I run a software company called stratosphere.io, all the data I'm talking about on this podcast. I've been just reading it right off of here. Like when we're talking about Shopify's KPIs, we scrape all that data and put it into one place. It's a nice, easy to use web application and, that, and it's completely for free at stratosphere.io. Thank you so much, Brayden. I'll make sure to link all of those in the show notes. Becca, thanks so much. We'll have to do this again. 
I like Google. I don't like Apple. The reason why I feel that is just the structural advantages that Google has. So I'll go into more of why I like Google and I'll share a little concrete tip for your listeners. 